Hi, and welcome to Community Hotline. I'm your host, Monica Weitzel. In honor of Pride Month, we'll be learning about some services specifically for the LGBTQ plus community by talking with Quest Center for Integrative Health. Then we'll be talking with the mayor and city manager of the small but growing town of Wood Village about efforts to help Wood Village thrive and to put their town on the map as a leader in diversity, equity, and inclusion. Finally, we'll be talking with Real Choice Initiative, a local nonprofit led by and for our disabled community, leading a survey for Portland residents who identify as having a disability and health concerns. It's all coming up next on Community Hotline. In honor of Pride Month, we'll be highlighting the Quest Center for Integrative Health, a wellness organization that was originally founded to serve people living with HIV AIDS. Over time, they've expanded their services and remain dedicated to providing a space in which anyone can express themselves along the spectrum of gender and sexuality. We'll be talking about Quest's new program, specifically for the transgender and non-binary community, as well as their upcoming participation in Portland's virtual Pride Parade. With us today, we have Justine DaCosta, HIV Services Program Coordinator, and Richard Weinstein, HIV Services Peer Support Specialist. It's great to have you here with us today. Thank you so much. Yeah, thanks for joining us. So I wanted to find out a little bit about a new program that you have going on called, uh, I believe it's the Gender Flux Clubhouse. Is that yes. right? Yes, very excited about it. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, tell me, tell me about that. What, <laughs> uh, what prompted it and what is it all about? So um, it started a few weeks ago. Um, myself and Gracie started it because we felt there was an, a service uh, available to transgender identifying people, non-binary. So we wanted to create a safe space where people that identify that way to gather and support each other through their transition or through their experience in a similar space of people that identify the same way. Is there an actual clubhouse or is there, it? <laughs> it's a really good question Monica there's not a clubhouse it's more of an idea but um, it is a safe space that people can join and just share their experience strength and hope yeah a safe space is kind of uh, what it's all about isn't it you, yeah, especially you can't express now. yourself without that yeah you yeah. can't exactly yeah. yeah and I'm just finding that there really needs to be this area for people to come and gather so it started how, how is it going so far so we've had some good members come. Um, I would say it's in its very early stage. We've had some consistent membership, but we are looking to expand and reaching out to the community to have more people join. Good, good. Yeah. Well, hopefully they can see this and know that they can join. Now, if they want to join the clubhouse uh, mm -hmm. and be a member, do they need to be uh, working already with Quest? <laughs> That's a really good question also, Monica. Um, right now it is for Quest members only, but we are looking to expand to non-Quest members. And uh, I'm looking for a way to somehow get out that information to people that are not Quest involved already. So I'm not okay. sure exactly how to do that yet, but we are looking to expand. Yeah. You let us know when that happens. Maybe we yeah. can help with that. So uh, this, this supports, uh, you said that um, non-binary and trans community, mm -hmm. are you, um, is there a specific programming that goes with that or is it just the people are there to, to talk and just to, um, you know, mm -hmm. get, get information out or to share their experiences? Yeah, no, it's just to share their experience. There's no therapeutic model. We're not okay. trying to change anything <laughs> or provide any sort of mental health um, leaning towards it, but we're just trying to have a space for people that do identify this way to share their experiences and share, you know, a place where I don't feel like there, it exists already. So um, okay. it's, I felt it was really important for a place for people that are usually marginalized or overlooked to okay. have a space for their voices to be heard. A non-judgmental space. Is and no, that's a very really yeah. Yeah. Yes, very really, much, a, Thank you for saying deal. that. Yeah, yeah well. it is a big deal. Yeah, it is, it is. So what is your role in the clubhouse then? So I'm one of the co-facilitators. Gracie and myself um, do that together. Um, I myself am not non-binary or transgender. I'm a gay man, mm -hmm. but um, I've been in the field for over 15 years. I started a place in New York and I came to um, Portland, Oregon about a year and a half ago. And I found that I, there wasn't this um, area or space to be had. So I wanted to provide that. Great. That's great. I'm sure that there are a lot of people who are appreciating that. Um, Justine, maybe you, can you tell me a little bit about um, the recovery house? Are you familiar with that? I mean, is that something you work with? The recovery home um, is a sober living environment. It's a safe space. Um, it is 
a place for community. Um, it's part of our FSR program, which is Finding and Sustaining Recovery. Mm -hmm. And that's an integrative behavioral health treatment program at Quest that includes um, yoga, acupuncture, nutrition, it brings all of these things together. Quest partnered with Bridges to Change to create the Recovery House um, where people can live in this safe space, sober environment, they're supported. Um, and everyone is also a member of um, FSR, the Finding okay. and Sustaining Recovery Program. Good, good. It, it seems, well, obviously in the name, Integrative is part of the name of your organization, but it seems like uh, the holistic approach really seems to work. And then also that community plays a huge part in all of the services you provide. Would you agree with that? Community is the core of Quest. And then that's really how it was founded. Um, we had, you know, for many, many years from its inception in the 80s, there was nutrition night um, where the community would come together and, and make a meal and eat together. Um, and we're waiting to do that again, you know, after this pandemic passes through. Um, but even now we realize, you know, how important, even you know, more than ever right now, community is everything. Um, and yeah, the recovery home is just an extension of that. So have people still been there since COVID? I mean, have you been able to continue that? Absolutely. Okay. We, I believe we're full and, and, and have been. Um, and it's, it's, a, it's a space that is, um, it's for our LGBTQ uh, plus um, identifying folks. Um, with particular, um, we, we really, you know, are supportive of, well, of everybody that is there, but also um, HIV positive folks. Um, there are um, a couple of, uh, Ryan, there's some Ryan White funding um, that goes into a portion of the home. Good, good deal. Uh, so tell me a little bit more uh, about the HIV services. Both of you can probably uh, give me information on that because that was how you originally started was supporting people with HIV or AIDS and um, and it's still a, a core component of your organization, right? Right, that, that was how Quest started was supporting HIV positive folks um, during the beginning of the AIDS crisis. And it's, it's grown from there into a, a full integrative healthcare um, system and uh, our in HIV services in our program um, we ha have peer support so we have peer support specialists that work um, with with clients um, we also have groups we have uh, a men's group uh, that meets on Fridays and we also have the women of wisdom group which is a group for female identified um, individuals who are HIV positive Right. And I run the men's group. By the I was way. going to say, Richard, I bet you <laughs> run the men's group. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yes, yes. What, what, what have you found is one of the most important things that you can offer uh, people in that situation? What, what, of, of all the things that the components of this integrative health, what, what is something that really stands out that helps that community? Uh, connection. Um, connection. A place for people to, again, meet um, people that have shared experience, um, especially during the pandemic. The biggest thing is isolation. Um, this is the one place that I look forward to every Friday where they can be with other people outside of their little isolated bubble. So it's been so powerful and important for them. Yeah. And, yeah. and for me, for being part of that. I mean, it's been really fabulous and I'm so happy that we provide this service. Yeah, uh, I I'm, I love that you provide all the services. Mm -hmm. I met I met one of uh, one of your members uh, about a year ago, and it was in the pan during the pandemic, and she just had nothing but good things to say about the support that she felt. You know, coming, she had to come from out of town, and, and it was a uh, you know it was kind of moving mm -hmm. actually. Um, so, you know, it sounds like the the support, the um, connection is is really important. How how is all this funded? Because I believe a good portion of your uh, membership are low income or marginalized communities, is that right? Right, so more than 70% of our clients um, are considered low income, um, underinsured or uninsured. So we do um, re rely on donations and you can donate on our website. Uh, we also have uh, annual fundraiser, which is uh, always a blast. Um, it was virtual yeah. this year but still it's so great for the community to come together and celebrate Quest. Yeah, right. So that's something hopefully this next year you can do it in person perhaps, um, mm -hmm. but, but people can go ahead and donate. So this is something near and dear to someone's heart or something they feel is really important then, then go to the website and check it out. They can donate there. Good. Absolutely. I do know that you have been involved in, in the Pride Parade for the last 
I don't know how many years. Are you going, you're going to do that again this year? Because this uh, next month, oh, this is going to be Pride Month. Yeah, Pride June. Month, yeah. 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 So will you be involved again? <laughs> we will. So it'll be virtual this year. Um, and it will be on Pride Northwest YouTube channel. It will be streamed on June 20th. Okay. Um, good. We will be doing some some filming prior to that, and then it'll be streamed then. Wonderful. Oh, good. Well, we can look forward to that. I'll make sure we get that information on our on our screen as well. Since June is Pride Month, maybe you can talk a little bit about the the importance of supporting the LGBTQ plus uh, community. You know, this community is one that is more likely to be affected by issues such as substance use. That's why the recovery home, for example, um, is there to support this community, particularly. Um, Richard, would you like to say anything about about how? No, I mean, like um, we know that in the LGBT community, there is a higher incidence of addiction, and that the services that we provide can be catered more for that because there could be more of a need in that area. So that's why the house is open to more people, but it is geared towards the LGBT community because there's more of a need. It's a lot about safety, isn't it? Their, mm -hmm. their, their feelings of safety and their actual physical safety too. I yeah, imagine. and being seen and recognized that, you know, you do have more of an obstacle and we're here to support that. Right. right. So, and create extra, that community. Right. Yeah. Right. Any extra help you can get to get by in this mm -hmm. life, especially now, is appreciated, I'm sure. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Is there anything else that you want to tell us about, about um, your clubhouse or your, uh, your services and the kinds of things that you provide to the community that you want to share with us today? I mean, I would I love how Justine, you said that, you know, community is a heart of Quest. And I would say that Quest just has a really big heart and that we provide services for all people that are in need. And I think that if people need naturopathic health, acupuncture, mental health services, HIV services, drug addiction services, we are there for the community. So that's a lot yeah. of services. And it, and, uh, and I get the feeling that it feels like a real a family affair. It really does. It yeah. really does. Yeah. 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 Thank you, Justine and Richard, so much for sharing your information with us today. And I hope that uh, your virtual parade is fun and that people will donate generously. Thanks very much. Thank, Thank you so much, so Monica. Much. Have You're a great welcome. Day. Thank Bye. you. Bye. And, and thanks to our viewers today. Thanks for joining us. Um, from all of us at Metro East, stay safe, stay healthy. For years, known as that little town you drive through on the way to Mount Hood, Wood Village is really coming into its own. Under the leadership of Mayor Scott Harden, along with the City Council and City Manager Greg Dirks, Wood Village is poised to become a destination rather than just part of the journey. From new construction to a city government that takes equity and inclusion issues from talk to action, you'll find a small town getting ready to move forward with serious planning and intention. With us today are Mayor Scott Harden and City Manager Greg Dirks. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for being here today. Mayor Harden, I want to start with you. The name Wood Village kind of evokes a, a cute little mountain getaway to me, with um, you know, complete with elves and gnomes. But uh, you know, in the past, it was more often just a stop on the way to Mount Hood. What kind of image do you want for Wood Village? What, what do you envision? Well, we often talk about putting the wood back in Wood Village. And, you know, when you look at uh, past large expansions, whether it be uh, Walmart or the town center, uh, you know, unfortunately, we sort of missed that vision. Uh, but I think we're spot on uh, with the design for the new byway apartments, uh, the design for a new city hall, uh, the potential design uh, for some upcoming apartments that will also be built on Halsey, uh, you know, where we have the large wood trusses and uh, large wood poles. Uh, some stone at the bottom of those poles. So it, it gives us that uh, rustic outdoor wood look uh, that, uh, that matches up with our name and uh, matches up with the desire that our, our planning commission and our, and our design review board and ultimately our council have for our city. There's a lot going on. You, you mentioned that the work that's being done on the Halsey Corridor, that in itself was a, a partnership, wasn't it, with two other jurisdictions with uh, Troutdale and Fairview? Is that correct? That's correct. Yep. Okay. And we feel like we've kind of taken the lead in how it will look with the, you know, amount of development that is already uh, planned and is underway uh, along Halsey Street inside of the Wood Village part of the corridor. 
and it's uh, uh, and like facades uh, throughout the corridor are something that uh, all of the cities are thinking about then with distinct wayfinding or pieces of art that would let you know when you've gone from one city to the other. Nice. I like that. Greg, do you have any, um, any feelings on the, on the way it's coming along? Is it, yeah, is it a- I mean, everything's coming along exceptionally. Well, actually, I, I quite like your elves and gnomes uh, thing. For Wind Village. <laughs> I've, I've never yeah. heard of that, but I, I like that. Uh, you know, we kind of call our style Northwest Cascadian, mm-hmm. um, you know, borrowing upon the basalts from the Columbia River Gorge, the wood elements. And we've really been able to, the last few years, really capture that in the work on Main Street and Halsey and really put it into a perspective that, you know, a couple of decades ago was was harder for those in leadership positions here to, to really visualize. And as, as the mayor said, it wasn't for lack of want uh, with some of the earlier developments in the early 2000s. There was always that passion there. And now that we've been able to articulate it, it it's coming across exceptionally well, as you can see from new developments. And with the Main Street's piece, you know, downtown Troutville has this, you know, quaint, you know, cute turn of the century kind of Main Street look. We're getting our Northwest Cascadian look, you know, and, and Fairview's finding finding their their look and feel, which is kind of uh, that brick feel and, um, you know, taller building look. And so it's, it's really neat seeing the three cities come together with each of their unique distinct feels. And yet we're all, we're all together on this corridor and get some really great synergy and some branding and advertising for our communities that are often overlooked for more of the more populated Portland uh, central places like Northwest 23rd or the Pearl District, for example, versus, you know, we, we have a lot to offer here too, and not just for, for guests and tourists, but for residents as well. And I think they're starting to see that too. And, you know, our creation of more walkable communities and places you just, you just want to explore and feel good about. What, what's been the biggest challenge as far as working on this whole project? Either one of you. I'd say timing. Um, <laughs> yep. You know, t- timing, yeah. timing's been been interesting. It's taken some projects take longer than than you want, just out of the necessity of of partners, other uh, constraints and time restrictions. So we've we've luckily been been real fortunate with some development going on in the corridor that's gone in step with some of our efforts and work, like like the byway, for example. I mean, that goes back several years into its initial planning and development stage, to where we see it now. Um, versus things like we're putting in four pedestrian activated rapid flashing beacon crosswalks on Halsey Street. You know, and we're, we're that's a partnership with Multnomah County, who's been a wonderful partner in this too, since Halsey's a, a county road, and they've been amenable to some of these new and unique stylings and some advantageous uh, projects there. And so they're doing all the design work. We have funding for the construction, and it's just, we, you know, we would have wanted to build a year ago, you know, and there's still you know, that last one still being designed um, that we just we want to get it built today uh, because we, we see we see the need today. Once you see it underway and you realize that it's going to be built with the vision that you have, you just want it to be done, you know. And uh, you know, July can't get here quick enough. That's when we anticipate moving into uh, into New City Hall. Uh, our second meeting in July uh, will likely be the first. Uh, meeting in that in that building and uh, you know I, I just want you know this third Tuesday of July to get here as fast as it possibly can. I, I bet you do. Uh, tell me a little bit more about the, the city hall. I know that it's uh, it's considerably bigger and uh, nicer than than the old city hall as far as I'm sure it, it was fine in its time but you'd outgrown it and this this one is yep. is more of a municipal building not just city hall right it, it encompasses right. more yep. City Hall and uh, and uh, and the community center, and so the uh, council chambers and the lobby are actually a, a, a great room uh, that will fit uh, uh, probably eight or ten eight to ten person round tables. There's also a, a 320 some square foot uh, a conference room named for a longtime community volunteer Stanley and Rita Dirks uh, that will be uh, available for lease. Uh, and then there's uh, another 192 square foot uh, conference room that's in the staff area uh, to hold uh, all staff meetings and that sort of thing. So significantly more uh, community room and more meeting room. Uh, but there's, you know, there's lots of reasons to brag about it. Uh, not only is it going to be beautiful, but it's also built debt free, you know, with the technically just a tiny bit of debt, 1.6 million from uh, our urban renewal bond, our first bond issuance. But, uh, you know, the proceeds of the land sale and the money that we had saved 
to uh, uh, build a new uh, city hall is covering the bill for the most part. And so that's that's something that not a lot of cities can say that they could make that kind of uh, municipal infrastructure uh, change without borrowing money. I think that's and, impressive, <laughs> very impressive. And so, yeah. and so you know, it's, uh, you know, and, and outside it will have, it will honor our veterans. Uh, it will honor the people that were uh, serving uh, on our council and commissions uh, uh, during the uh, building of the of the new city hall. Uh, so, you know, there'll be a, a, a chance to really, you know, honor people that uh, uh, were involved in the process or have served our communities in other ways uh, by protecting it, for instance. And and so we're just, uh, we're incredibly excited. You know, even the dais uh, has uh, removable wings and it can fold in and could make a huge conference table. So, uh, you know, we're looking forward to, um, you know, instead of inviting people to give commentary or uh, testimony at a, at a council meeting and be behind a pedestal, uh, you know, they can just sit down at the table and, uh, and join the board potentially and, uh, have a, have a discussion, you know, as opposed to a, a monologue and feel at home. And that's really what we want people to, to do when they're at city hall is feel at home. And again, with that community first focus, you know, we, we call it the great room. Uh, cause again, we want, we want people to hold their, their wedding anniversaries or just their weddings, their quinceañeras, family reunions. So that's, that's what we want the space to be. We don't want people to think City Hall is a place where they turn in their water bills. City Hall and, and the Civic Center is, just, is where the what the village living room is. And that's the last line actually on the dedication plaque out front. It says, welcome home. Because um, that, that's just where we want people to feel like. I mean, we're, we're a unique, special place. And we hope this building enables us to, to do more for the people that call it home. I love, I love that. I, I love the, um, the priority of putting community first. I think that's really, really important. And, and I think it will eventually uh, encourage people to engage more with their government as well, you know, that's, because that's you won't be hope. intimidating. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think yeah. that's great. Yeah. And, and don't forget that part of that uh, new structure will be uh, the, a room for Metro East to be <laughs> yes. taking your Yeah, taking not, city not hall just meeting, a, your, a corner in a closet. It's actually a, it's actually a purpose-built uh, area. Nice, nice. <laughs> quite nice. Behind a hidden door, actually. That's <laughs> great. That's great. Yeah. But it, you know, yeah. transparency in government is good and it sounds like you're just opening the doors and that's really important I, i'm wondering about also w when you're uh when you've been doing all this planning it sounds like you've really been holistic in your planning you know how is this going to affect that and how will that affect this and, and that's really important but how do you make decisions as far as um who you hire and what kinds of uh, businesses you want in your area because i know scott you and your team have really kind of got a reputation now for being very progressive in ideas of equity and inclusion. And, and I, and I think that's great. I, you know, fully support that. And I think most people do, but, but I know that you're, you've been using some of that, that lens to, to make some of those decisions, haven't you? Uh, we have uh, primarily to uh, sort of uh, shape how we function and make sure that we're including people. But for instance, uh, uh, while you can't necessarily put requirements into the contracting, we did put in a preference for uh for uh, minority uh, or women-owned businesses among the subcontractors. Uh, we put in a priority for hiring local subcontractors. And I know that there was uh, there were was at least one Wood Village subcontractor, at least one Troutdale subcontractor and subcontractors from Gresham. And so, you know, we do have, uh, we do have uh, local businesses that are uh, benefiting from that construction. And that was very important to us. Um, our DEI is primarily, though, a focus on better serving our citizens, because really, um, when you start to talk about institutional racism, you find that uh, uh, you're not necessarily, hopefully at least, not necessarily doing it on purpose, but it exists nonetheless. For instance, we just saw a presentation from REACH. It's a, a, a racial and equity uh, health uh, program at, uh, at Multnomah County on the county's crash data and how road design and active transportation design uh, has uh, the accidents are disproportionately people of color and the people that die as a result of those accidents are disproportionately people of color. And so I don't think that we might have ever dreamed that road design uh, could lead to some sort of institutional or systemic racism. 
but the statistics say it are. There it is, excuse me. And so uh, while we're looking at uh, Halsey Street, for instance, uh, the other thing that slows it down is just, you know, kind of getting the money to do things. And so we have a TGM grant coming for how to safely design the streetscape. And now we can make those safe designs with that, uh, that REACH study as a lens and make sure we aren't inadvertently creating a place that's, uh, you know, more dangerous for people of color uh, than it is for anyone else. It's interesting, uh, isn't it? Because there are so many things we haven't, we don't think about and because we haven't had to, because it hasn't necessarily affected us personally, but yep. it does affect our community. That's right. And, you know, it's, uh, uh, for me personally, it's, it's started with the area, uh, uh, Black Lives Matter movement, you know, at least my, my, I never considered, would never considered myself to personally be a racist, uh, but I hadn't given a lot of thought to institutional racism uh, prior to the Black Lives Matter movement. And, and it can't be just a, a three word phrase and you say the phrase, so you're automatically an ally or an agent for change. You, you know, you have to go out and discover where the racism is and 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 put a halt to it you know when you when you know better you do better and and we feel the need to know better we want uh, our uh, uh, communities of color to have ownership in their city and so we hired a Hatfield fellow uh, we do almost every year to add staff capacity and to focus on specific projects and one of those projects was how our mobile home uh, owners might become the owners of the land as well through co-ops and so, you know, we now have a, a book that uh, uh, talks to them about uh, how to contact uh, CASA in this area and uh, how to, uh, you know, work with them and work with potential lenders uh, to maybe, you know, buy the land uh, that they that they live on. Uh, you know, we've uh, speaking of the land, you know, obviously we weren't the first ones to live here. Uh, that was uh, Native Americans. And so we have uh, worked with the Confederated Tribes of the Grand Ron to put together a land acknowledgement statement uh, that we uh, read at the beginning of each city council meeting. And it's also uh, uh, printed on the agendas for the meetings of our other boards as well, like Planning Commission or uh, Parks Commission. And so, uh, you know, we, uh, we want to uh, uh, remember the people that were the original stewards of the land and that uh, and uh, honor the fact that uh, they didn't give it up by choice. They were forced and, and just, uh, you know, uh, thank them for, you know, basically, uh, you know, holding the place where we live, continually holding the place where we, we live close to their hearts. That's beautiful. So, that's, that's, that's a lot of work that you've been doing, a lot of work that some uh, jurisdictions, some organizations, some businesses, uh, people would never think to do. And that's, yep. I, that's, I think, what I find most impressive, you really taking it seriously and not just giving a lip service. So, Greg, do you have anything you want to add about the, the work that, that's been done in the DEI field for Wood Yeah, Village? and, you know, actually, Mon you, Monica, you picked up a really intriguing uh, piece there when you talked about, you know, streetscape and how you've never had to think about that in terms of, of your life experiences. And that's how, you know, I tend to view DEI work. It's, you know, we all have our implicit biases, our implicit memories, our, our lives you know, our shared experience in the lens that in which we view the world. And DEI is just adding more lenses that we can look at things through. When we look at a policy, a program, a, a thing, we can say, this makes sense to me and how I've, you know, lived my life or my shared experience with that life. If I, if I put these, you know, new lenses on from someone else, oh, wow, we, we should, you know, this, there's an obstacle here, a barrier for their effective participation. Let's, let's tweak this piece. And you put on another lens and go, oh, and now we need it. It's about this molding and shaping to do, uh, you know, the best work that, that we can. It's not necessarily disadvantageous to any group. It's all about just removing barriers because now we're, we're seeing a more holistic picture of what we're trying to do here. And in public service, I mean, that's, that's the only reason we exist is to serve the public. And sometimes it's also looking at, at you know, past experiences. I'm going to say urban renewal, for example, because we've, for Wood Village, when we created the agency just over a decade ago, said, you know, the board said we will never forcibly condemn a property for redevelopment. If they're a willing seller, that's fine. You know, we, we will work with that. But we're not going to condemn properties for, you know, a big shiny new something. Not all urban renewal agencies around the country are like that. And a lot of times they were, you know, they were used 
I would like to say with good intentions, but had unintended consequences. You know, neighborhoods or, or parts of a city that had its own cultural designation or feel or vibe were, were wiped away. Um, you know, and, and our board and council is that, that that's not okay. You know, this, this should be for the people and creating things for the people that call Wood Village home, whether they've been here 10 years ago or, or will be here 10 years from now. And that's where doing things like the crosswalk project is something that benefits those who live here. And we also know it and improves the marketability for, for an area for those that maybe want to wanting to sell. And then that's where you get to the other interesting intersection of you create a really cool place to live. And if you don't own that land, you're in trouble being relocated uh, through higher rents or not having your rent uh, ex ex lease term extended. And so that's where things like the co-op model we were really fascinated in because manufactured home parks tend to be a form of naturally occurring affordable housing. That should be preserved in, in, in our collective minds. Now, we, we can't be the bankroll for it, unfortunately. You know, we can't uh, necessarily help connect every single dot, but we can try to be the best conduit we can to connect people with all the right resources. Uh, we also know we serve a very low income area uh, within the Portland metro area. So we put together a comprehensive resource guide available in English, Spanish, and Russian. And another thing that luckily that the council enabled, because I think it's fantastic, is we have cert pay. Uh, for those that speak or write or understand languages other than English. So for example, we have a couple Spanish uh, speaking people on our team, a Russian speaker on our team, a Vietnamese speaker, speaker on our team. So they actually council authorized cert pay for that. And so we partnered with a third party, essentially testing service that can you know verify the, the skill level. And if they need a thir certain threshold, uh, they get that incentive pay because it's something that, that we feel valuable as an organization to serve our community. And so we should we should uh, reward our team members that can have that skill or encourage other team members to get the skill that we'll actually pay for and then actually, you know, give them the cert pay as well. Uh, I want you to know I'm taking notes here. <laughs> These are some really good ideas. They well, are. Um, yeah. So and 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 in addition to that, you know, uh, so if both of our Spanish speakers are currently uh, working uh, with a guest at City Hall, for instance. Uh, they, uh, we also have hired an interpretation service that is on demand called Linguava, and we pay for the interpretation, and they do languages besides the languages that our staff speaks. I served on the uh, Reynolds School District's budget committee for three biennia, and, you know, between the, the six years, there were somewhere between 40 and as many as 80 different languages spoken in the district. And so, uh, you know, what we have learned is we've tried to do better service, like Greg said, with our resource guide or doing Spanish language articles in our in our newsletter is that uh, Spanish is not enough, you know. And so uh, it's so uh, Linguava, you know, gives us the uh, uh, the ability to sort of interpret globally, I guess, for for lack of a, a better description. You know, there's there, there's not a language that. Uh, we might encounter in our city uh, that we won't be able to interpret now. And that's it's impressive. Uh, yeah, that's great. Yeah, the, the use of it's really cool. So if we get a walk-in customer or a guest, there, there's actually a card at the front counter and it says, you know, what language do you speak? But that is then phrased in all the languages available through Linguavo. So a person just has to point to, to which one uh, that they speak. So it makes it easy for, for the guest and it makes it really easy for us then to connect with that that real-time translation service. And we just used it a couple of weeks ago uh, for an Arabic speaking business owner. And it was, it was a fantastic experience. So the, to finally con, you know, connect the dots and you know, there are things we needed for, for, for compliance sake. He was trying to get across what he was trying to do with his vision for his business. And through that, we're able to get to a, a better place. <laughs> That's, that's, that's great. That's wonderful. I mean, that's, that it makes for a much more welcoming um, place to be. I mean, you know, it, it, I have to wonder about that when people have something written that says, what language do you speak? But it's only in English. Yeah, <laughs> you know? English. Yep, so yep. That, that was a really cool piece about Linguava. I was like, oh yeah, we, we picked the right firm. Uh, yeah. for, for that, Good, uh, deal. No. Good deal. Um, well, and, you know, and, and our population uh, since the 2000, census the 2000 census uh has doubled uh roughly and you know it's it's uh uh people of color uh primarily you know uh we're part of the Reynolds school district where uh, better than 40 percent of the students in the school district are latino uh and only 29 percent are white 
And so the people uh, that are moving here, we welcome them and we want to be able to serve them, uh, but we can't best serve them if, uh, if we can't ask them questions, ask them what it is that they need and, and make it comfortable for them to, uh, to tell us, you know, and, you know, and, and, and as we've gone through this work, we realized we weren't asking enough questions or we weren't asking questions of the right people uh, in order to, uh, to best serve folks. I sat at a meeting not too long ago. I'm not, I'm not uh, disappointed in any decision that I've made in the, in the 10 years uh, that I've been on the Wood Village City Council. I'm just disappointed that I didn't ask enough people before I made the decision. You know, I wasn't doing the work to find out uh, how it was uh, impacting everybody. And what we've learned as a council is just because it seemed okay to us doesn't mean that it is. That's right. That's right. But the fact that you now know and you are now asking the right questions is, you know, that's a step in the right direction, something we all need to do. I don't want to take up too much more of your time, but I do want to ask you um, quickly about what's coming up this summer for Wood Village. I, you have an annual event you usually have called Wood Village Night Out. Is that happening again this year? Yes, it is. I'm so happy to say it is. I mean, certainly last year, COVID really threw a wrench. We were all kind of on reaction mode for so long that a lot of our community events we just didn't even know we're still res we were responding to that public health emergency, let alone trying to do these events, which brings the community together. We get a lot out of it because as people can come to us and uh, share some stories. They at least put some faces to names that they may see on the website. And so luckily last fall, we were able to do, you know, a drive through pumpkin fest uh, and then some other kind of drive through events. So night out uh, this year is going to be a hybrid. So part drive through event. So we have uh, a little swag bag of some some resources, some things for the kids. And we always like to put in uh, some uh, baking boxes. So, you know, baking kits for, for a cake or something, something family to go home, bake together, eat together, enjoy together. That was a huge hit at our Easter egg hunt. Uh, we had a yes, few things was. people could bake. <laughs> so we're like, well, let's, what's, what are some good summertime uh, baking things? So we'll have those bakes to hand out. Uh, from 6 to 8, uh, July 16th at the Woodville's Baptist Church, where we typically hold the in-person event. So it'll be a drive through component for them. But then we're also holding a, a virtual component like we did for our tree lighting with messages from community partners about their services or just a positive, uplifting or encouraging message from some of them, our partners, and then some musical performances from the local uh, schools, such as Mountain Community College. And I believe either Reynolds High School or Middle School will put together something because those kids have been working hard all year, too, with the teachers yeah. and trying to you know, put together something through Zoom and, and everything else. And we, we want to show off those talents that are in our community in a, just a positive, fun way. So it's it won't be the same as years past, but we're bringing it back. And then hopefully next year, bigger, better, and, and probably vastly different than the night out people seen before. It sounds like yep. a lot of fun. I, I'm going to let you go now. You gentlemen have given me uh, all sorts of good information. <laughs> and, um, I, and I'm just really pleased to, to see the direction that Wood Village is going. So thank you so much, uh, Mayor Scott and Greg. It's really thank been you. great to talk to you. And to all of our, my um, pleasure. thank you, thank you. And to yep. all of our viewers out there um, from Metro East, please stay safe, stay healthy, and check out Wood Village. Real Choice Initiative is led by and for people with disabilities. Their work involves facilitating sustainable, independent living opportunities for their communities. In addition, Real Choice seeks to educate and advocate. Most recently, Real Choice has partnered with the City of Portland on creating a comprehensive survey designed to help government officials, policymakers, and the public in understanding the barriers that prevent the disabled community from living a full and truly engaged life. With us today is Ellen Hines, the Real Choice Initiative Director and Project Manager, and Nico Serra, who is the Project Lead and Board Member. Thanks for joining us today. Thank you. Thanks for having us. So Real Choice Initiative has spent quite a bit of time, I believe, developing a survey to, uh, to get information from the disabled community and, and others with uh, health issues to find out what they need. Is that pretty much it in a nutshell? Yeah, um, so we, we have been working on this for over three years now. Um, 
it's been a long haul. <laughs> that is a uh, long time. Yeah. It was a, a project that I, the city of Portland realized several years ago that as a population, people with disabilities and people with health concerns were not as engaged as other populations. And they started wondering why. And that was the impetus for this survey. Okay. So you are not looking for any specific disability. You're, you're going the whole wide range of disabilities, which, which is huge. How do you reach all those people? How do you reach, for example, a homeless community, which has a you know, high percentage of people with disabilities? What, what has been your strategy here? Yeah, Ellen, so that's a really good question, and the pandemic has added another layer. And everyone is mostly communicating over the internet, over Zoom, or, or whatever the platform is. It's been an interesting dilemma to figure out how to reach people who aren't on the internet. And we're not. We haven't. It's not perfect. We have. Yeah. Um, but we're trying to reach out to people in physical locations. And also with um, help asking our partner organizations to help us reach out to people who might not have internet access. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's also what we're doing here. We wanted to reach out to people who are watching TV and maybe are on the internet. Um, we're also doing some shows on KABU um, mm -hmm. and uh, putting some effort out into to reaching out to, to people who are living in long-term care facilities and nursing homes and residential facilities. Um, and before the pandemic, we had this very extensive clipboard pen in hand. We're gonna go out and feed on the ground, do this sort of thing. And once the pandemic started, we really had to let go of that. And it's changing how we're doing some of that. We also have five different languages available in, in addition to being able to um, do it by screen reader for people who are, who are blind or visually impaired. Good, good. Well, you've thought of most everything, I'm sure, but I'm sure there'll be something that comes up that has not occurred to you. That's usually the way it goes. Yeah, so, our, our community is incredibly diverse. Yeah. We have a lot of diverse needs, and, and sometimes that puts us in, in conflict with one another. Um, some people might need like high, high light, uh, like visual light, and some people have a really hard time with the light. Some people can't have scents um, like perfume and you know when we try to physically get in the same space so there there's some things that are you know that make it really hard for us everybody's got their individual thing we have tried to to think of as many things as we can and we've also said if there's something happening that's making this hard for you for example we don't have it available in a language that you you read or speak let us know and we'll we'll get a translator um, for example we do have ASL interpretation available for someone, you know, if the deafblind community is another community we really want to connect with. You, you're not limiting it to um, disabilities per se. You're limiting it. I mean, you're, you're extending it to people with, with other health concerns. Is that right? Can you explain yeah. about that a little bit? Sure. Yeah, I do. <laughs> Yeah, Ellen said, I feel like part of the work is is getting to who we're trying to reach. Uh, um, letting people know what we are very broad interpretation. And letting people know that we, we have a very broad interpretation. Uh, 
heart condition. Of disability and health conditions. I was we want to learn from everyone that fits in that. We think that everyone needs to be needs to be heard. In order um, for the best policy decisions to be made, the the needs everyone's needs need to be considered. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and I, and I think um, you know what Alan is hitting on here too is that um, I think that this this especially comes up when we're speaking with elders is that they will not be caught dead using the word disabled. They are not disabled. I'm just old. You know, I'm not disabled. I just had a knee replacement or a hip replacement, and and that is fine. Um, the reality is that they have just as hard of time using stairs as I do, and I use a power wheelchair. And so, what we're hoping to do with this survey is to really assess those barriers and our our difficulties getting into services and um, and, and getting around the city and things like that. So um, we're really hoping that even if folks don't identify with the word disabled, that they will still take this survey and let us know, can you get can you use your sidewalk? Do you even have sidewalk? Do you, can you get to your doctor's office? Have you had trouble with, uh, you know, there's many different things. We, it's about the, the social determinants of health, which are very, very extensive. So um, yeah, we hope people will, will take the survey if they feel that they have health, imp, uh, health conditions that impact their life. And that's a lot okay. of people. The, the disability population, we're, we're the only minority that folks can join in an instant. Right? <laughs> what a deal. <laughs> right? Yes, that's you right. Know, that's it, right. It's, You're not born into it necessarily, but you might be. But yeah. Right. You know, <laughs> and, and so um, wouldn't it be wonderful if having, a, you know, having something having something happen that impacts your health in a, in a profound way didn't mean the end of your quality of life. You, you mentioned something about your research. How has the research been going and what has been the response from the community? Yeah, thank you for asking that. You wanna? Mm -hmm. um, so, it's been amazing. Uh, I'll start with that. Uh, Alan said, it's been amazing. I'll start with that. Uh, I'm yes, yeah. And we have a total of So I looked over the numbers yesterday, and um, and we have over 500 surveys taken. Responses. And that's across the five languages. And that's across the five different languages. And I I that. Um, it's been, Alan said, I'm really impressed with the response from the Chinese speaking community. We've had 50, we've had 50 Chinese um, um, uh, language uh, survey <laughs> surveys completed, which has been really cool. Um, we've had uh, almost 20 Spanish speaking surveys yeah, sure. completed. Sure. Some Russian, yeah. So, yeah. Keep doing a lot of We want to keep doing more outreach in languages other than English. And focus our efforts on that. Specifically, can we say, um, uh, we haven't seen many responses coming in um, in the Vietnamese um, language surveys yet. Um, just a few in the Russian community. Um, and we're hoping to see more Spanish speakers. Um, and what and and while we're recording this, we'll say that that this is we're just a weekend right now while we're recording this. So this is really exciting. At the end of all of this, we're going to be writing a report to give to the city council, and you know we're going to be noting these things. I understand that there is a um, gathering that's going to take place after this 
uh, survey is completed that's really, it sounds like as, as important as the, as the survey itself. What can you tell me about that? Yeah, yeah so um, after the, 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 the initial data collection, we're going to have a town hall where people who take the survey will be sent a link if, the, if they sign up for that during the survey. And it's gonna be a virtual town hall uh, where, where Amanda and other uh, interpreters will be helping uh, to communicate with us. And we're gonna be doing a general overview of the data that we've collected and going over the nuances and saying, did, did we miss anything? And, and really getting feedback from community members in, in a live setting um, and yeah, checking back. And that was, uh, that was something that uh, when we originally put the proposal together, we worked with the Coalition of Communities of Color and they were, they were the ones that said, this is super important, you need to do this. And we completely agreed. They call it research justice. <laughs> looping the community back in afterwards and and the hope is that we're creating a people's plan i like it we just love that it's so yeah. brilliant and so we're we're really excited about that that is going to be a huge undertaking for us it will be huge and and i don't know the way it's going you may need you know more than one session because i think you can only have so many people on a zoom i'm not sure however <laughs> how, how many how many times does a uh, does the disabled community of all different types of disabilities ever get together in one place to talk? You know, that's, that's a really good question. So um, the, the people with disabilities, even just identifying with disabilities, as we touched on earlier, so many people don't even want to identify that way because there's so many things that are insinuated around work and school and who you are and what you do in the world and what it means and all those things. So um, besides just identifying with us, um, once you get into the service reality and ADA rules and social security and all of these other things, um, we are all divided into different groups based on our disabilities. Um, so um, Alan, for example, um, has different disabilities than I do. Um, so he's split into one category. Um, um, IDD, uh, intellectual and developmental disabilities are split into one category. I have acquired disabilities. I became disabled uh, in my adulthood. Um, people who are blind are in one category. People who are deaf in another. Veterans are in a different category. Elders are in another category. Um, so so there, there are more categories that I'm not even getting into. So, so you can imagine that it, it becomes very difficult for us as um, as all these separate communities with all of our diverse needs to come together ever to do anything. What are your next steps after, after the, the town hall and, and that's all done? What do, you, what do you do then? Or is it all up to the city? So um, in the fall, we should mention that we are, we are collaborating with Dr. Masami Nishishiba up at the Center for Public Service at Portland State University. Um, we are going to collaborate with her to uh, put all of this together into a report and present that to City Council in the fall. And then, and then, and then in some ways, the real work starts. Um, because all of this information we hope will, we hope to make available to everyone that wants to use it. Um, and then when we'll have all this information about our communities mm -hmm. and what we know about how we are living and what our life experience is like. We know that we're going to need more in-depth information. Our survey is very broad. It covers many different topics. Yeah. Since the city has, uh, sorry, Alan said, we decided that since the city has virtually nothing about our community, in terms of data, 
go broad. We decided to go broad. To instead of going deep, and, and I'll just add there that um, so when people do take the survey, because we wanted to make sure that it wasn't taking up too much of people's time, they won't get all of the questions. Everyone is given different segments of the survey. So, so the intention is to keep it at about 20 to 30 minutes for most folks. Um, so you won't get all, you won't get the whole survey. You will get some of the surveys. Now, everybody will get demographic questions. Everybody's gonna ask for your zip code and certain things, but you, not everybody's gonna get asked about their access to healthcare. You might get access to education. You might get, so there's certain segments that not everybody's gonna get Interesting. all. Interesting, okay. Yeah, and, and I assume that maybe after you come up with the report that other nonprofits can use those as a jumping off place to use in maybe lobbying for needs for their communities. Yeah. Would that be a fair assumption? Yeah. Yeah, that's absolutely a, the idea. Data is the drive for policy. And the first step in policy creation is data. And so um, Alan works at Community Vision as the housing access director. He sits on five different boards. Um, I sit on two boards. Um, and I, I work several jobs doing educational, mostly educational work. Um, and uh, we, we pass state laws. We work on local laws here in the city of Portland. We do quite a bit of activist and organizing work and presentations and other things like that. So we ourselves are really excited about getting to use this, this information. And, and we're sure, you know, the disability communities, we just come up with the most brilliant, ingenious, uh, ways to get around things and deal with things. And, and I think that once we get our hands on this data, like the sky's the limit. It's just going to be wonderful. You are very busy people, I must say. <laughs> you have a lot going on in your lives. But uh, I think the work that you're doing here is, is very commendable. And I appreciate that you're doing it for, for all of us because, you know, at any point, any of us could be, you know, be part of that community and, and everybody knows somebody and everybody has a loved one that has, you know, is dealing with something. So I appreciate the work that you're doing very, very much. Uh, is there anything else you want to, to tell us? I, we can, we'll have the information on the screen as to, you know, the, the deadline for this and, and how to access the, uh, the, the survey, but is there anything you want to leave us with? Oh yeah. Uh, so Please take the survey. It'll be available until July 2nd at realchoiceoregon.com. <laughs> and, and, and tell your friends and have them take it too. Yeah, <laughs> sounds good. Help get the word out, uh, especially to, to, to elders and to people who are living in institutions. We, we especially want to hear from folks uh, that aren't on the internet. Sure. Great. Thank you both so very much. I really appreciate it, Alan and Nico. And um, good luck. And I have a feeling we'll be hearing a lot more about the survey in the, in the days to come. Thank you. Take care. Time. You're welcome. And thank you to our, uh, to our viewers today. I hope you will go out there. If you, if you qualify to take this, please do take this survey, pass it along and share it with people. And to all of you, thank you from Metro East. Uh, stay safe, stay healthy. Thanks for watching this episode of Community Hotline. Please share the information you've learned with your friends and neighbors. Until next time, I'm Monica Weitzel.